What's up, guys? Early on this Tuesday morning, March 12th, 2024, just hours removed from Monday Night Raw, 3 11 24. As it sits right now, we are 25 days away from WrestleMania 40. And I have in front of me, in my hand, the full review for last night's Raw. My thoughts in real time. We're going to talk about it. Did this show last night finally allow you to feel like it's WrestleMania season? Or was it just another show of a lot of matches, a lot of promos, and nothing worth remembering? We'll talk all about it, including the third hour, where WWE had a massive decision to make. Sami Zayn or Chad Gable? And how do you go about it? We'll talk all about it. The Raw Review 31124, just 25 days away from Mania. But the cold open to this review is a little bit more on the heavier discussion side of things uh, because massive developments in the Vince McMahon trafficking suit. Top executives have been named and revealed. And it's important to talk about this because it has direct implications with WWE currently and going forward. So that's why this is very important. For instance, one of the names is Nick Khan, obviously the current CEO of WWE. And another name is Stephanie McMahon, a former massive executive in WWE and the daughter of Vincent Kennedy McMahon, of course. Uh, She was revealed as... Corporate officer number three, I believe. Nick Khan was corporate officer number one. And yes, you don't have to tap in your Steiner math. Jumping from one to three, there is also a corporate officer number two that was revealed as well. So I'm going to go over excerpts from a, a really good article from the New York Post, pretty much encompassing everything you need to know about these latest developments. The New York Post, this article is from uh, Christian Arnold. And it says, and I quote from the New York Post, the identities of two WWE executives identified as corporate officer number one and two in a trafficking lawsuit against Vince McMahon and former talent relations executive John Laurinaitis have been revealed. The two men are WWE president Nick Khan and COO Brad Bloom. The suit, which was filed against McMahon in the WWE, does not allege any misconduct by Khan or Bloom, but charges that the pair were a part of a scheme to employ Grant in a completely undefined role, in quotes, except for the understanding that she remain a sexual slave to be used and trafficked by McMahon within the WWE. The suit paints the two executives as men who help to facilitate and cover it up to protect WWE. WWE responded to these recent allegations to Nick Khan and Bloom. WWE says the following. WWE takes Ms. Grant's allegations very seriously and has no tolerance for any physical abuse or unwanted physical contact. Neither Nick Khan nor Brad Bloom prior to the suit being filed on January 25th, 2024, were aware of any allegation by Ms. Grant or that she was the victim of abuse or unwanted physical contact, nor does the complaint allege that either had knowledge of such. So obviously those statements contradict one another, right? WWE alleging they had no knowledge in the suit, claiming no, they were part of the scheme to cover it all up. But if you dig into WWE's statement a little bit more, right, and I quote from WWE, Nick Khan nor Brad Bloom, prior to the suit being filed, were aware of any allegation. So they weren't aware of allegations doesn't quite mean you didn't know what was going on, right? Chances are, if you work at WWE headquarters, Stanford, Connecticut, if you're working that close to Vincent Kennedy McMahon, chances are you know exactly what's going on. Chances are. <laughs> But WWE, the way they worded this, they weren't aware of any allegations. 
nor does the complaint allege that either had knowledge of such, which it does. It doesn't directly, or at least not what we are privy to now. But it does say that they were a part of the cover up, that they knew that this person, Janelle Grant, should probably be not employed in the position that she is or in the meetings that she was in, which even Janelle Grant states she had no business being in those top executive meetings. In fact, Stephanie McMahon, well, we'll wait till we get to that part. I think that's coming up. Uh, first, I just want to go over Grant's lawyer, Ann Callis. She confirmed uh, that the reporting is accurate over the identities of corporate officer number one and corporate officer number two. Just so there's no misunderstanding, due diligence was done. Ducks were put up in a row. A lot of research went into this. A lot of digging. And they came up with Nick Khan and Bloom absolutely did a cover up. So that's what Grant's lawyer is saying. Now, Vince McMahon's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, was also named as corporate officer number three in this suit. Now, it's important to talk Stephanie's role in all of this because she was briefly mentioned and rather ambiguously, but confirmed to be corporate officer number three. Now, the report is stating that or alleging that Stephanie McMahon had prior knowledge to allegations in the past. We don't know, or at least I haven't read, if those are allegations pertaining to Grant or other females. But this is alleging that Stephanie McMahon had prior knowledge uh, to allegations. And there was one instance where Janelle Grant walked into an executive meeting which again, she felt she had no business being in, probably because she shouldn't have been in it. And she walks in and Stephanie McMahon motioned over to her to sit next to her. So Stephanie motioned over, sit next to me. Instead of asking, who are you? What are you doing here? You probably shouldn't be here. Stephanie's like, come on over. Yeah, you hanging out with my dad later? Cool. <laughs> Just put a do not disturb outside of the office uh, <laughs> office door. Um, but in all seriousness, man, um, that's, that's one of those things where obviously if you are working that closely, the Vince McMahon, especially if you're related to Vince, you know, what's going on, right? We, we all know that Stephanie triple H who he's got to be right now, like curled up in a ball in a corner somewhere, hoping that his name does not get dropped. <laughs> because at this point, Nick Khan's now being chucked out there. Stephanie's being chucked out there. You got to think it's a, it's only a matter of time, right? But you, you, if you're that close to Vince, you know what's going on, right? But you most likely these individuals are turning a blind eye, hoping it's just consensual. It's just a it's just a two adults. Having a relationship, you know, not seeing what everybody else is seeing, right? Which is no, uh, the CEO of any, co the, the boss, a president of any company or entity can't be doing that. You can't, you can't just meet somebody on the outside, give them a job with no qualifications. You just make up a job out of nowhere just so you can spend that quality time in the office two, three times a day. And bring them in to the executive meetings so they can have prior no or knowledge of all the company doings. There's so much wrong with this, right? We know this. <laughs> if Vince was just meeting with this woman at the Olive Garden every night, no issue. This is bigger than that, right? This is overstepping your bounds big time. And I'm sure that Stephanie and, and everyone else that had knowledge of it, you know, they, they didn't want to think the worst or anything other than Vince is just getting some. Right. So they're going to turn a blind eye Two adults doing their thing, even if it is in dad's office. So I, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you don't want to drag anybody, man, you know, like, and, and we don't know the story anyway. So you don't want to drag anybody from the jump, but you can, you also want to put yourself in their shoes. I understand why they would turn a blind eye, but they also, they, meaning Stephanie and Nick Khan and anybody else that's aware of Vince McMahon's doings, you know, you have to look at it from everybody else's point of view. Step out of the WWE bubble for a moment and see all the wrong in it, right? And then you'll, you'll start to, the picture will be clearer, right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk 
in the pro wrestling world of, of, you know, can Janelle Grant be trusted or it's her word versus Vince's and no, that's, that's fine, right? That'll be settled in, in the court of law. It's the upfront issue, right? Which is Vince McMahon, no matter what, completely overstepped his bounds one too many times. That's the issue up front. Vince McMahon clearly in the wrong before we even find out or, or, or jump into the Janelle Grant case. The way Vince McMahon was conducting business is completely wrong. That's the problem. It's actually very illegal, all the things he was doing. I think people are just missing that, right? They're just willing to give Vince a pass on everything. <laughs> Trust me. I grew up WWE. All I knew was Vince McMahon running the place. You know, I always wanted to give the dude the benefit of the doubt. I'm pretty sure I was team Vince with the whole steroid trial. But sometimes you got to go, no, that's pretty wrong, actually. You know, that's stepping on a lot of the little people just so you can be the big man on top. Literally and figuratively. I don't know. Interesting legal strategy. I'll leave it at that. That's everything that we know as of... Uh, This recording, guys, this is obviously an ever-developing story. This is the latest details coming out, and they're pretty massive. Again, it needs to be talked about because this is the current president of WWE, Nick Khan, now being accused of, of covering up and scheming to cover up Vince McMahon's wrongdoings, and even Stephanie, a past executive, being brought in saying that she did have prior knowledge of allegations and that she was aware of Janelle in these executive meetings when she shouldn't have been there, even motioning to, hey, sit next to me. Be my wing girl. So, interesting. We'll see what develops, guys, but I'll be on top of it for sure for you guys. All right, moving on to the Raw review. Uh, This is 3-11-24's Raw. This is 26 days away from Mania as it sat last night. Um, And it's so early, we're just hours removed from the show, so it's odd to even say last night. But this was Raw from 311. As of now, there's only three Monday Night Raws left, and then it's WrestleMania. The show kicked off with Drew Mack and Sethington Rollins. That's right. Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins kicked the show off with a promo back and forth. Um... That's it. That's all I got in the notes. Drew Mack and Seth promo kicks us off. I had plenty of space to give all the details. There's no details to give. In fact, if I just close my eyes, I think about what can I remember from that promo? It's really just a Drew McIntyre line that made me laugh. There was a moment where Seth was like, give me another Claymore, Drew. Come on. Oh, that's right. You're a coward. And he gets on his knees. He says, what about now? So he's on his knees saying, give it to me. (laughs) Then he turns around. He's like, give it to me. So Drew McIntyre is like, before this gets any weirder. (laughs) So that just made BC laugh. Other than that, guys, that was it. They, They cut the promo. And I think Seth just walked away again or something like that. Or Drew walked away. And then Seth. Seth said, the reason that I'm looking past you is because you're the least of my concerns for WrestleMania. And that's when Drew Mack came back and they kind of had that stare off. That's it. That's it. You you know, you got to remember, guys, you you know, you say, well, BC, your bar's a little too high. BC, expectations are a little high. You got to lower them. No, I say raise yours, right? You got to remember, this is their third match in just a few months. Right, They wrestled at a, a PLE a few months back. On January 1st, they had a Monday Night Raw match. And now they're going to wrestle again at, at Mania in, in just three weeks. So this is the third time we're seeing this match in a few months. So if you're going to do it three times in a few months, guys, each time you have to raise, they have to raise the standards, right? They have to raise the bar, Right. So they start off here, and then the second match should be up here, and the third match up here. That's what you're hoping for, right? It usually doesn't work that way, but you try, right? Sequels are usually not as good as the original. We know that. But you try, right? If you notice a lot of sequels in Hollywood, even though they don't measure up to the first one, 
they usually go all out, right? The budget is massive. There's more effects. There's more action. There's more, more, more. They're trying, right? The build, the storyline in pro wrestling should absolutely be better. If the match delivers, that's another story. Michaels Taker 25, there's no way Michaels Taker 26 was going to beat that. So even in wrestling, the match, the sequel, most likely isn't going to beat the first one. But the story should be elevated, no question. The story throughout, the feud should be building, not just staying stagnant. And here we are, their third match is on the horizon in three weeks. And we're just getting them talking to one another. And the only thing you can remember is Drew McIntyre's funny statement. Before this gets any weirder. And then I don't even know what he said. I can't even tell. I don't remember any of it. It wasn't wor- worth writing down, I can assure you. So that's the problem I have with this. If this was their first time meeting, okay. You know how I know it's okay? Because we've seen these exact promos the first time they met. So we've seen this. And first of all, they've met a hundred times in the past. I'm just saying they've met three times in the last several months with this version-ish of Drew and Seth. Drew's a little bit more going heel now than the first time. But you get my point. But back, 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 they've wrestled hundreds of times. But... Man, it's like if this was the first time recently that they, they're mixing it up, okay, this promo is fine. But for, the, for WrestleMania, man, and that's your first segment of Raw, it does not get us excited for the rest of Raw. It certainly doesn't get you excited for Drew and Seth. That, if that promo sold you on Drew and Seth Part 3, good for you. Because with a bar that that low, you can never be disappointed. (laughs) Anything WWE throws at you, you're going to love. So maybe I do literally applaud that. (laughs) Because you'd never be upset. Just be like, "Ah, I don't care what they give me. I'm going to love this. I'm going to buy my ticket and yell, this is awesome to every match. Every moment. The time of my life at WWE. (laughs) I can't do that, man. I I can't. You know, I know that they have the resources. They have the talent. They have the time. Three hours on a Monday. There's no reason. These shows, these segments, these characters, everything shouldn't be jumping off the the screen. There's no reason that we shouldn't be talking about Drew and Seth kicking off Raw in the most epic of ways. That they did something so awesome storyline-wise. The characters went to another level last night. Goosebumps. But it didn't happen. They talked, and then we went to Michael Cole, who gave us a video package. Or I think we went to, no, we went to uh, Triple H, unveiling his uh, Ruby or something. That's a YouTube 1 million subscriber, something, or 10 million. So I don't even know how many millions. But that's how we're kicking off Raw, right? We got Triple H unveiling his new YouTube plaque. Could we do better is the question. I'm just asking, can we do better? It's rhetorical. Of course we can. First matchup of the night. Face versus face. It's Paul Levesque McMahon. You knew this was coming. Liv Morgan versus Becky Lynch. Neither one of these individuals can lose. Becky's going to Mania against Rhea. And Liv just got back. Liv's got a lot of... Liv's got a lot of support and a lot of momentum. And you just can't have her lose. But again, you can't have Becky lose. It's a weird match to to book just for the middle of Monday Night Raw. And again, face versus face. Why? It's just going to hurt one of the faces. Or at least keep them both even keel so one of them can't go over the other. Splitting your audience. This is what he does. There, There was three face versus face matches last night, guys. Three. And there was one heel versus heel. Four of your matches... The audience is like, uh, what eh, do I, eh, confused. Four, one heel versus heel, which I'm astonished that there was only one heel versus heel match, and then three face versus faces, and this was one, this was the first of the four. Anyway, um, it was a good match. It's Liv and Becky. You never really thought that it wouldn't be. Good match, ample time, two commercial breaks, so they really let the match breathe. Becky ends up pinning Liv Morgan. 
So it was indeed Morgan looking up at the lights when it was all said and done. Post-match, Rhea Ripley comes to the ring. She and Becky trade some words, and much like Drew and Seth, it was a whole lot of nothing. No substance. Becky ends the promo with something like, I, you're going to find out I'm big time Bex. Or, I don't even know. And she walks away, and Rhea's just looking at her like, well, I look like an idiot, and I came all the way down here looking like a badass. You talk some trash, and then you left. <laughs> now I'm standing here. Dag nabbit. I mean, we just saw that promo with Drew and Seth, and nothing happened. And now you're doing it with Rhea and Becky. You're starting to see a theme. Levesque McMahon is, is selling the build to these matches for Mania by just having them go out and simplistically just say some words. This way, Levesque McMahon doesn't have to use any, any creative cells, right? He doesn't have to use any energy, right? It's, this is easy. This is, I mean, you could be in preschool and have a posty pad with a Sharpie pen or crayon and you could book this what's that mania drew and seth okay monday night raw we'll just have drew and seth go out and say words hold on hold on say words say how do you spell words w-o-r-d you sure yes paul it's w-o-r-d okay thank you words okay so drew and seth are gonna say words I think after I put face versus face, Becky and Liv in the ring, I think I'm going to have Rhea come down. And Rhea and Becky are going to say words. How do you spell words? Uh, again, Paul, it is W-O-R. That's right. That's right. Words. Okay. Rhea and Becky say words. And that wasn't it, by the way. There's more words later, right? We'll get to Cody Rhodes and all of that hour two. But this is this is three weeks. Be- I could say maybe three months before Mania. But three weeks. This is what we're getting. Words and nothing impact. Nothing we're talking about the next. Literally, my notes have no zingers. My notes have nothing of of substance. Now, what Candice LeRae said last night in her match is being talked about more than anything in these promos. That's true, guys. I, I, I don't BS you. <laughs> Even if you don't like what I'm saying or you don't agree with what I'm saying, I, I'm, there's no lies detected. Like Candice LeRae, because I'm, I'm gauging everything, right? That's why I wait hours after before I like to do these reviews. I don't like to just jump on the doohickey machine and start reviewing without all the knowledge, all my ducks in a row. You know, Candice LeRae and what she said is more more polarizing than any promo that was cut last night to sell WrestleMania. That's a problem. So anyway, Rhea comes to the ring after Liv Morgan loses flat on her back looking up at the lights and they just say words and Becky takes off. Um, and then we went backstage to Nick Aldis and Adam Pierce. They announced the Judgment Day will defend their tag titles at WrestleMania 40 in a six-pack challenge ladder match. <laughs> you can't help but laugh when you hear that, man. You're thinking WTF to the most amplified of measurements. What are we talking about? Have we gotten that lazy? That lazy that you're just throwing every tag team you have into the fire because you don't want to think it through. You have two nights of WrestleMania, bare minimum 15 to 16 matches, and you're just going to throw all your tag team tag teams into one match. I'm not a fan of Miz and R-Truth facing the Judgment Day at Mania. I'll be the first one to say that. That doesn't feel WrestleMania to me. As much as everybody is in love with our truth right now, him in The Miz, after just last year, we saw Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens hoisting those titles up against the Usos at WrestleMania in the main event. That is Mania worthy. That's the tag team division. Miz and our truth versus Judgment Day. Yeah, it's a it's a great downscale. But at least do it, right? At least it's a number one contenders versus champions. You build the story up, you make us care, and you deliver at the event. They didn't even want to give Miz and our truth. They didn't want to care about it. 
It's too much energy to think of an actual storyline with a feud. It's too much effort to build a story. So they're just going to add everybody in there. Six teams, everybody. I don't even know if they announced who they are. They're probably going to be all the usual suspects, right? All the same teams that we've been seeing facing each other every week. From uh, Imperium, right? Vinci and Geyser will be out there. The New Day will mostly be out there, most likely. Kree Brothers. Uh, Regeneration X. Tommaso and Johnny Gargano. Um, who am I missing? Maybe, maybe Alpha Academy will be brought into this. Chad and Otis, maybe. Oh, uh, maybe Pretty Deadly. I, I, I don't even know. It's. <sighs> like, what do you even, how do you not have a tag team title match lined up? A six pack. Now I know, basically, it could be fun. That's what we're hoping for. That's the only thing you can hope for, right? It's a ladder match with a bunch of humans. It's going to be an absolute. Uh, it's it's going to be a train wreck. It just is. We know that, and usually that that'll probably make everybody go. This is awesome, right? Because it'll be nonstop action, and and they're basically like the toy, and we're all the cats, and we're all going to follow all the toys, and all the action's going to be all over the place. I mean, that's what Levesque McMahon is hoping for, right? Everybody go out there, be crash test dummies, and hey, easy peasy. I didn't got to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Easy creative for me. You guys have the the absolute crash dummy train wreck, and I'll get praised for it. Man, Papa H with the six pack letter match challenge match thing. Man, Levesque McMahon. I, I I can't tell. I can't tell. <laughs> it's you know Vince McMahon's booking the last ten years was bad. H's is so damn bad, too. It's like different types of bad, like really bad, you know? And Paul Levesque McMahon's is just like a version of bad that I just, you just want to pound your dome piece into a wall. <laughs> it's just so bad. The face versus faces, the heels versus heels, the, the multi-man schmoz matches, no real storylines being developed. I mean, just la we're three weeks away from Mania. And they're just last night telling us about a six-pack challenge. Just last night, we're getting the number one contenders for the tag title. Three weeks away from, from Mania, guys. Three weeks. 25 days. And we're just now getting the number one contenders for the tag titles, and they're not even number one. It's the number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five contenders. Five tag, number five contenders get, get the shot at the title. And they're all tag teams, by the way, that recently already had tag title opportunities, and they lost. I'm using common sense and logic again. Three weeks away, we're just finding out about a six-pack challenge for the titles. If you're looking for the women, they don't even have number one. They don't even have a match yet. That's going to be two weeks before WrestleMania, and maybe they'll throw a team out there. But the women, they have no number one content. They have no match. Gunther, the IC title. The IC title. We just found out who's taking him on last night, three weeks before Mania. The Intercontinental title doesn't even have a feud. They came to that via a, a gauntlet match last night, which we'll talk about. Levesque McMahon cannot be bothered to set up actual feuds. Multi-month long. He is a very short-term booker, sadly. McMahon books, Levesque McMahon books in month-to-month -month spurts. We'll go over that a little bit, exactly what I mean. I'll give you an example, several, in just a little bit, by the way. But when I heard this announced, I was like, wow, at that point, just give us Miz and R-Truth then. As much as I, I that's not WrestleMania worthy, uh, it's better than a six. But again, again, should it be fun? Uh, most likely, right? Because you're just going to see everybody jumping off the top of a ladder. It'll be a spot fest. And you don't know if you're watching gymnastics, if you're at the zoo watching a bunch of monkeys. Or is this a pro wrestling match? You won't know. <laughs> and you probably won't even care. As long as you can yell, this is awesome. And then you go online and you rate it 10 stars.
Meanwhile, BC's over here like, how are we getting to these obnoxious matches? Why are these decisions being made basically last minute and they don't even make sense? Everybody has gotten a tag title match with Judgment Day recently. And when they all lost, now they all get another chance at Mania together. The number five contenders is the same as the number one contenders. How does that equate? At least make it make sense, right? At least make it make sense. Like, if this is what you wanted to do for Mania, you build up all these teams in the process, in the months leading up. Keep them away from Judgment Day. Even if you gotta face jobbers, right? I don't care if it's Pretty Deadly versus Danny Dipshit, Dugenheimer, and Fuck Wad Fred. Cool. And you build them up, and then it makes sense. That's my biggest issue with all this. Nothing ever makes sense with this company. Next up, Ivy Nile and Maxine versus Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. Faces versus faces. The second of the hour. Not just of Raw. Second of the hour. Becky and Liv earlier. And then ending hour one was this faces versus faces. So two ladies face versus face matchups. Crowd was silent in confusion. Confuse them, you'll lose them. Triple H, Paul Levesque McMahon has not booked them correctly anyway, all four of these ladies. Then you put all four faces together, the crowd is going to be silent, like they were last night in Houston. Uh, Candice LeRae starts talking crap, degrading Maxine. Um, Very controversial, right? A lot of the community is, is absolutely like sickened by what was said. The other half of the community is like, it's pro wrestling, she's getting heat, right? I can see both sides, trust me. Um, (laughs) Watching over three decades of pro wrestling, um, I've heard a lot worse um, in that ring between individuals. But I will say, this, there was no reason for it. There was no need. We're not talking about outrage, all right? When you look at what was said, right, in, in the exact quote I have up, You know why everyone... Now, this was Candice LeRae turning heel, uh, degrading Maxine. You know why everyone boos you? You don't belong here. You think the internet hates you. You should hear what the girls in the locker room say. It's a good thing your dead brother isn't here to see what an embarrassment you've become. Ah, man. If if you got a result to that, Chances are you're just you're not doing anything correctly. And I, Paul Levesque McMahon to whether this was his idea up front or just Paul Levesque McMahon approving this. Uh, if this was a school test, he gets an F. Levesque McMahon gets an F. If that's what Levesque McMahon thinks is going to get somebody over as a heel or that's what's needed to ignite a face like Maxine. That's low-hanging fruit, man. Um, I just don't... Again, it's not even outrage. Like, 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 there's a lot of people in the community that are just outraged at that. Like, that has no business. And there are a lot of people going, it's wrestling, relax. I'm indifferent on both sides. Just looking at what was said in that situation, I don't understand why that would even be needed. Like... It's a good thing your dead brother isn't here to see what an embarrassment you become. Ugh. We can leave her brother who's passed on, I think, out of this. Odd. V- very odd. I-, I don't know. So again, I- I'm indifferent to it. It's just, when I heard it up front, I had to do like a double take. Like, I- did they seriously just do that for a Candice LeRae heel turn? So then Candace uses those words to really touch to the soul of Maxine, and then she pins Maxine. One, two, three. Candace and Indy win. Indy's kind of like, why did you do that? Candace is like, I wanted the W. So they're not really agreeing on this new Candace, or at least Indy doesn't like the new Candace. So it remains to be seen if Indy turns heel with Candace, or does this ignite something between Candace and Indy? If you guys don't know, Maxine has been taking a lot of heat online for her wrestling. Now, it's been greatly hidden because she's been with Alpha Academy. So even BZ was like letting it slide because I was like, all right, I thought she was just supposed to be a goofy wrestler. But a lot of fans 
are really expecting her to be like a really good wrestler and have these good matchups, that's high expectations when they see, I always preach high expectations, but know who we're dealing with, right? That's like putting Scarlett Bordeaux in there and expecting her to hang 25 minutes with Mercedes Monet. Right, th- those are moments where maybe the high expectations can be lowered just a little bit, right? Maxine, it's Maxine. We're not expecting a lot. She's with Alpha Academy. You're going to see the little gimmicky matches with Otis and with Chad, right? The, the, the uh, what do you call them? The mixed tag matchups. And maybe once in a while, Maxine will be in there and surprise us. But a lot of fans, they truly were like, no, she just sucks. And that's that. Um, and then Rhea Ripley, like, comes to her, a lot of the ladies came to her, to, and that's that, that was horrible, because if it was justified, then that's a good thing, right? Come to the aid of your brothers and sisters. That's awesome. But they, they got all pissed, that the locker room got pissed off over a video that surfaced of a fan just saying, you suck, Maxine, don't come back to his town. That's all he said. He paid money. They're they're in his hometown of the of the the live event, and he's saying you suck, Maxine. Don't come back. That's all he said. Nothing derogatory. No harassing words. You suck. Don't come back. It's the opposite of harassing, right? He's telling you not to come. He don't want nothing to do with you. <laughs> and and all these wrestlers got pissed off. Rhea Ripley's like, this is disgusting. If only you guys had people coming to your job and. And degrading you or so I don't even know what she was saying. I'm like, what is Rhea Ripley saying? So Rhea Ripley got a lot of backlash for that from a lot of fans. And, and I'm glad she did because they need to know. You know, you want to critique fans and, and, and rip fans. That's fine if it's justified. But that fan did nothing wrong. You suck, Maxine. Don't come back. And that's what got the entire locker room into a tither. You can't even go to a wrestling event and say you suck anymore. Kurt Angle, man, his whole gimmick was you suck, the whole theme song. He played off of that. These days, you can't even say it to a wrestler. They get all up in their feelings, their emotions. So Rhea Ripley took a lot of backlash. So if you notice, last Monday night, Maxine was not brought out for the live crowd. Rhea Ripley was not brought out for the live crowd. Both were there for Raw. Both were were not brought out, not even Rhea. They wanted to kind of let it settle. So I'm just giving you guys some backstory of why Maxine, why Candace said, you think the internet hates you. Um, You should hear what the girls in the locker room say. So she's like the mean girl, right? You ever see the movie Mean Girls? I haven't either, but I know of it. And I know it must be about mean girls. And Candace LeRae is going to be that type of character, it looks like. But the brother line, not needed. Levesque McMahon takes an L on that one. That one, it just didn't land. Didn't land with the live crowd, obviously. I mean, she was directly speaking into Maxine's ear anyway. But for us, it just, it landed, it, it, was, it was just weird. It just felt off. It didn't feel right. I'll tell you that much. It did not feel right at all. That was the end of our one, two face versus face matchups, both involving the women's division and Aldis and Pierce declaring backstage that the Judgment Day will be facing every tag team in existence at WrestleMania. Oh, and Seth and Drew had words with one another. So what I am telling you is that if you missed our one, you missed nothing. Hour two, Cody Rhodes sit down interview with Michael Cole, middle of the ring. This was a nice heartfelt message about finishing his story. And that was it. That is your Roman Cody build. To WrestleMania 40, 40th year anniversary of WrestleMania. The night two main event is a rematch, a match we already saw last year, Cody and Roman. The other main event is Drew and Seth, another match we've seen over and over again. And that's your build. Instead of adding substance, instead of building to this story that needs to be finished, which is the same story from last year. Now it's just regurgitated. Instead of doing anything special, Cody just had words with Michael Cole, not even with Roman. And let's be honest, the match that's being sold more than Roman and Cody in the damn title is The Rock and Roman and Cody and Seth. That's really what's being promoted more than anything. 
But the only line that I can remember in Cody's promo last night was talking about how podcasters are going to talk about how he's always wearing a suit. Why, why would you need, feel the need to mention that, right? I like Cody. I do. But that's funny. He's always in a suit, like he's going to a five-star restaurant and catching a Broadway show or something magnificent. He's having a night out on the town in the city. Now he's going to a wrestling match. And he's always getting out of the, off the tour bus in a five-piece suit, smiling at everything. Not, not anyone, everybody, but the wall. Electrical equipment. He smiles at everything. He's smiling 24-7 in his five-piece suit. That's funny. It's funny, right? So we talk about it. We joke. We, 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 it, it's funny. That's all. Is there times we wish he maybe just ditched the suit, put on the, the, the warm-ups or something, really look like you're, you're, like, like you're ready for battle and you really are pissed off and you're dressed as such? Yeah, we would like to see that a little bit more, but... You know, we have fun with it, but, but I, I didn't understand where he was going with it. And he didn't know where he was going with it. He just, he's answering cold on it. And he's just like, I know podcasters are going to talk about how I'm always dressed in a suit. I guess he's alluding to like, that doesn't mean I'm not ready though, or I'm not prepared. Or, well, it kind of does though, right? Because perception is reality. You got to dress the part. Everybody knows that. You have to dress the part. But that's the only thing I can remember, you know? I'm not saying, I'm not even saying it's a bad promo. Cody, Cody's usually a good promo. Cody's good on the mic. Cody's a good storyteller. Ironic. Um, so it's not even saying it's a bad promo. It has nothing to do with uh, excitement, WrestleMania. That promo did nothing for, for, for Beast. I, I mean, when that was done, I wasn't like, whoa, I gotta see both Cody matches at Mania now. Completely missed the mark. Backstage, Liv and Becky, or backstage, they, they shake hands, right? You usually get this after the match when, when Levesque McMahon puts his faces together. After the match, they'll shake hands or hug it out, right? They waited on this one because they wanted Nia Jax to destroy them. So backstage, Becky and Becky and Liv shake hands. And Nia Jax comes in and Nia Jax beats him up. And that's the segment. Literally, that's all I have in my notes. <laughs> Liv and Becky shake hands. Nia beats him up. I even put LOL in the notes. <laughs> Just as a reference point that I actually laughed at that. I'm like, this, this is the booking. of This is going into mania. Nia Jax is main eventing the elimination chamber. Nia Jax is main eventing the chamber. Nia Jax doesn't even have a WrestleMania match, and Nia Jax is taking out your number one contender for the title and somebody who just came back with momentum, Liv Morgan. Nia Jax. Yeah, you can't help but just laugh. It's like, I mean, Levesque McMahon, if he was any more lost, he wouldn't find his way to headquarters. He wouldn't, he would not fight. He, he'd, be, he'd be completely dumbfounded on how to get back to Stanford. <laughs> I got to get back to Stanford. I got to, I have a job at the WWE headquarters. <laughs> uh, sir, you're currently in Kentucky. What? <laughs> how would I get there? <laughs> That's not Connecticut. Paul Levesque McMahon is lost. He's lost. I, it, or he just he just doesn't have it. He doesn't know how to book this this stuff. Unreal, man. And then Jay Uso, Jay Uso is just sitting in the middle of the ring, and he just challenges Jimmy just like that. I mean, we were all hoping that Jimmy and Jay was going to be a fun build, right? We all did, man, because that's a match we're looking forward to. Jimmy versus Jay. They've done nothing. Jimmy will show up on Raw once in a while and beat up Jay a little bit. I th Did Jay show up in SmackDown, I think? Friday, maybe? Maybe Jay did it once. Maybe it was Friday. I, I don't even remember. It's not memorable. And now Jay is just like, Jimmy, I say we meet at WrestleMania, and I'm going to beat the yeet out of you. That, that's a true story. Something like that, right? I'm gonna, I think it was that. I think that was the quote. I'm going to beat the yeet out of you. What does that mean? You're going to beat the yeet out of them? 
Oh no, not the yeet. Jimmy, save the yeet. Hide your yeet. Come on, Jay, relax. Let's think this through, man. Don't beat the yeet out of him. I don't know why BC would like the Attitude Era back. I don't know, because it was freaking cool. It was cool to wear all the t-shirts and go to school. It was the cool thing to do back then. You know why? Because it was cool. Wrestling was cool. Now we're beating the yeet out of people. Yeah, beat the yeet out of you. Don't make me beat the yeet out of you. Couldn't imagine going to school and about to get in your fight after school or at freaking uh, uh, at lunch outside the cafeteria, right? What, you're looking across the dude. You're about to fight. Dude, I'm going to beat the yeet out of you. Yeah, you ain't going to have any yeet left. What are we doing, guys? What are we doing? And that was it. Just challenges Jimmy like that. And I'm like, this is the Jimmy J build? And man, this match better deliver. Because it's clear there ain't no story to it anymore. Uh, basically, uh, the story is they were in the bloodline because they're actually brothers. They're twins, basically. And what happened is Jay was removed from the bloodline. Thank you. Yeah, thank I know the history lesson. I know all about it. And I can't tell you at all that this is an exciting build. Trust me, I want to see the match too. I was just hoping for a fun story with it. Ah, you can't ask for too much, BC. You can't even ask for the bare minimum, BC. This is Levesque McMahon we're talking about. Kabuki Warriors. Uh, then are facing Baszler and Stark. You guessed it, heels versus heels. You guys catching a theme here? HHH cannot stand booking faces versus heels. So the Kabuki, well, he just likes to confuse the audience. Kabuki Warriors defeat Baszler and Stark via pinfall. Uh, Kari pins Baszler off the insane elbow. Again, heels versus heels. And just like Xia Lee and Shinsuke Nakamura and so many others, Levesque McMahon gave Baszler and Zoe the mini push treatment, right? That's when you push them a few feet, but you take them back a mile. And I bring up Xia Lee and Shinsuke, but there's been many recently. But Xia Lee is one of the bigger cases where it looked like they were giving her a big push, right? She was knocking out Candice, knocking out Indy, and it was just to set up a loss to Becky Lynch and a loss to somebody in NXT. Uh, Valkyria, I think it was. That was it. And then you haven't seen Xia Lee since. She sits at catering or she stays home because they have nothing for her. It looked like they were giving her a mega push. You can't just give her two weeks of a W and see if that works. Or you you got to keep building. Shinsuke. They built him up to be a beast again, right? He started to get these Ws. They gave him these promos, these cool little visual. Everything was looking good. And it was just to lose to Cody and Sammy a couple of times. That was it. And now Shinsuke Nakamura is once again just relegated to that just irrelevant role. Those are just two of the more notable ones. Levesque McMahon books in month spurts, month po pockets, right? Two weeks you get a W, so we'll build you, build you up for two weeks, and then you're going to take two massive L's. But because we build you up for those two W's, you could take those two L's and really help up the next person who's going to take two W's and then take two L's. Does that make sense? Because that's what we've seen. Levesque McMahon is a short-term booker at its very worst. Anyway, Kabuki Warriors, not that the Kabuki Warriors should have been losing this, by the way. It's just the match is just a weird match, man. Heels versus heels, why? Why does Shayna and Zoe need to be in that match and take another L? Why? Why would that be needed? Why would you give them a little bit of a push just to already make them lose the tag title match? There's nowhere to go from there. So eventually they're just going to have to turn on each other and then you get Zoe and Baszler. The fact that nobody cares about them right now, is anybody going to care about them when they're individual taking on one another? Oops, I'm thinking ahead. That's not something we like to do in this company. R-Truth then comes to the ring with his What's Up song. His What's Up, it's 2024. And he's doing the What's Up song. Paul Levesque McMahon brought back the What's Up song. 
because our truth is, is hot right now in the wrestling industry. So they're like, fuck it. Just go back out there with your What's Up song. They'll eat it up. He's facing Damian Priest, who's been carrying around a briefcase for the better part of an entire year, and nobody cares about it. Nobody cares about when he's going to cash in. That's sad. That briefcase with Damien draws no emotion. I'm just the one that's going to tell to, to be real with you because we all like Damien Priest. But you can't tell me you have any emotion with that briefcase and Damien. You can't tell me that any scenario calls for Damien winning a title against anybody. He should not be beating Rollins, obviously. Drew McIntyre, he's not going to beat Seth and then, he, and then Damien beats Drew. Of course he's not going to beat Cody or Roman. He's not even booked as somebody that we would want to be a champion right now at the highest of levels. Like, you should be booking Damian Priest so strongly, trying to get him so freaking over that when that cash-in happens, it's electric. Instead, the only pop that's going to happen when when it's getting cashed in is is the thought from everybody like, oh, it's happening, right? That always draws a big response. But it's it's Damien. I forget. It's just an accessory. At this point, that briefcase is just an accessory for Damien. I don't even look at it. Like he, I, I forget that he can even cash in. That's sad. South of Heaven finisher gives Priest the pinfall victory over R-Truth. And I got to say, too, before I go any further, it was hilarious because Houston was flipping out over R-Truth like the dude was stone cold. I mean, out of their seats, flipping out, really, like, behind truth. That's good to see. You know, we all like our truth, but a a bit much. I mean, I don't... (laughs) I like our truth. I'm not understanding the craze. This is like a craze behind our truth. It's kind of funny. Like, I don't know what the expectation is. Tag title with Miz, right? Because he's not beating Gunther for the IC title just because, you you know, (laughs) fans are really behind him right now. Our truth is not the dude to beat Gunther. Stop. I just hear some of the wildest things when people are a fan of somebody and, and they just start saying, well, this person has to be world champion or they should be beating Gunther. I'm a Jinder Mahal fan. I know where that ends, right? Where, where I'm a fan, so I would like to see this. And I also know what should and shouldn't be happening. So I just hope people remember that, right? Our truth beating your money in the bank briefcase holder, who already is pretty damn irrelevant in terms of the briefcase and holding it, that's not smart business. So the fans were so let down. When the, when the pin happened, the fans were, I mean, they were just devastated. I had to laugh. I had to. Listen, it was a three hour show of just what is happening. So I had to take these laughs when they came. The third hour was dedicated to the gauntlet match, the main event, Ricochet and McDonuts, the first two in the ring. Ricochet defeats McDonuts via a shooting star pinfall. Bronson Reed is out third. Bronson Reed defeats Rico via top rope squash splash pinfall. Sami Zayn is out fourth. He defeats Bronson via the blue thunder bomb pinfall. Shinsuke Nakamura is out fifth. He is defeated via pinfall from Sami Sami Zayn via a haluva kick. And then it's down to the last two, Gable and Zayn. Zayn would score the ultimate W, pinning and defeating Gable via the awe-inspiring, ultra-devastating The Fruity Roll-Up. That's right. An odd way to end this matchup. But it's the way that Levesque McMahon went with. Zane over Gable. I'll look past the the stupid roll-up. And I'll look to the decision that was made. This is, uh, you know, we did a live stream on 15 minutes notice, by the way. Thank you to the thousands of you guys that have already caught that. But on 15 minutes notice, we did a... A live stream and, and the bulk of that was really who who do you go with Gable Zane because I'm 50 50 
So there's no wrong here. We knew, as we talked about in the live stream, the, the preview to Raw on this channel, we talked about it has to be either Gable or Zayn. We all know that, right? We just hope that Levesque McMahon, for once, just does the right thing and puts them in there. And sure enough, that's what happened. And then from there, once you have Gable and Zayn as the last two, then it's just, you know, it, it's his choice. And uh, he went... Sami Zayn, I have no problem with that. You could have went either way. I feel bad for Gable. Maybe they get the tag titles. Maybe Gable and Otis. If they're in that uh, that matchup at Mania. I think every tag team in existence is truly in it anyway. But Sami Zayn going for Gunther's title. I think this is where Gunther loses his title, guys. Sami Zayn, massive moment. Um, it's time to change hands for the title so that Gunther can now move to the main event scene so that Gunther can start to face people like, and I'll mix up the brands a little bit because WWE does that anyway, but to face people like CM Punk or Seth Rollins or Cody Rhodes or LA Knight, the, the, you know, the Randy Ortons. So because the last two years up front, you know, Gunther's just taken on Gable and Zane and Tazawa and Otis and Bronson and Miz. It's time. It's time. So even if you're like, oh, no, have the title stay with Gunther. No reason to drop it now. Well, there kind of is. And it's bigger than just who the title's going to. It's, it's for Gunther. It's time to move on. So then you say, well, maybe Gunther wins and maybe can't he just vacate it the next? No, that doesn't make any sense, man. This type of reign for Gunther, Mania 40, this is the moment where Sami Zayn, if there's a chance for Sami to get back on track, this is it. If you don't do it now, good luck in the future because Sami Zayn was the hottest thing in pro wrestling a year ago. And here we are a year later, one of the hottest things anyway, here we are a year later. And he was on a losing streak not long ago. This is it, man. If Sammy loses this matchup, where do you take him from there? And if you're wondering, this was a face versus face, obviously, to end this gauntlet match. Gable, Zane. So, of course, you had a handshake hug. Maybe not the handshake. You had to hug it out, right? Gable picked up Zane and they hugged it out. And then Gunther comes out, top of the ramp, staring down at Sammy Zane. We end the show. Fade to black. So that is Raw 3, 11, 24. There was a lot to discuss. I just don't know if any of it had substance. <laughs> a lot of it is just my, just, BC was just in awe yet again, and not in a good way. I just can't believe that these are the shows being produced. It's not just that Mania is getting close. Mania is in just over three weeks, man. And what are we truly getting, guys? What are we truly getting? I just went over three hours of Monday Night Raw. What, what, what happened on this show? Drew and Seth is your main event at Mania. And they talked. They had some words. Like we've seen 12 times in the past four months with these two. Becky and Rhea. That's your title match. They had words. Nothing you're going to remember. Cody Rhodes had words with Michael Cole. Talked about how the podcasters are going to talk about him always in a suit. Cool. Candice LeRae is the talk of the show. Just like last week. Guys, this is a true story. Michael Cole wearing antlers was the talk of Raw. The biggest headline from Raw all over the outlets was Michael Cole and Antlers. That should tell you how Mania season's going last week. Michael Cole and Antlers was the biggest trend, the biggest headlines, all of it. This week, it's Candice LeRae and what she said about Maxine's brother. Candice LeRae in, in, in comments to Maxine is the biggest talking point of Raw. That's when you know it's a problem. This is not mania season, or at least it doesn't feel it. It is, but this is not the right booking for it. But the Kabuki Warriors beat Baszler and, and Zoe, at least. We had a title match. Yeah, heels versus heels when the crowd couldn't care less. Gauntlet match was the best part of the night. No question. A lot at stake. Even though Gunther's number one contender, challenger, should have been a feud long 
long been in play. And, and if you're wondering, BC, how would you have done this a little different? Yeah, I would have had Gable come out first, run through everybody, and then Sami Zayn, or vice versa, right? Um, but the, the Ricochet Bronson thing, and then, and then, I I just just for Ricochet to score a W over Bronson to give him a little bit of shine. At this point, it's about Gable and Zayn, man. So my point is, I've seen much better gauntlet matches where somebody was actually created because of it, like Kofi Kingston, for instance, and many others. All right, that's it. That was a wow, but there was a lot to uh, lot to talk about, and of course, the cold open. We had to talk about the legalities, the breaking news. So, all right, guys, until next time, and there will be that next time. Top guys, we are out. Boom, 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 BC. Say and check you, peace.